Hello, I'm Edwin Newman. One of the most booming boom towns in the world is Jerusalem. Everywhere you look, something's going up. Under the pressure of immigration and economic expansion, this is true not only on the Israeli side, but in what used to be Jordanian Jerusalem. On both sides, the boom is evidence that Israel is settling in further, and is what the Israelis expect, confidently expect to be a permanent part of the Middle East. It is not without significance that the larger part of the construction force working on the boom is Arab. That is true not only in the territories Israel has occupied since the Six-Day War in 1967, but in Israel itself. After a quarter of a century, there is no peace between Israel and the Arab states, but there is a ceasefire, fairly well observed, and there is here and there in the Arab world an inkling of greater acceptance of Israel's existence. Still, there is also, of course, on the part of many Arabs, a persistent and even implacable opposition to Israel. And the Israelis know that real peace may be a long way off and that there may be much trouble ahead. They would be foolish to think anything else. But this is a fairly stable and hopeful time for them. And anyone who has made periodic visits to Israel notices that at once. The world has long since got used to the idea that a woman is in charge of Israel's affairs, Prime Minister Golda Meir. The fact is, an Israeli and world scene without Mrs. Meir would take a lot more getting used to. Mrs. Meir has been Prime Minister since March 1969. Before that, she had a variety of government posts and party posts. She was, among other things, minister in Moscow and foreign minister and it is Prime Minister Golda Meir who will be speaking freely today. Mr. Meir, I wonder whether we might begin by speaking of Arab groups of the kind that hijack airplanes and killed Israeli athletes in Munich. They talked a great deal about the Palestinian homeland and how they've been deprived of it. Is there any legitimacy in talk about an Arab-Palestinian homeland? No, I think not at any rate. If uh, the homeland that is referred to is supposed to be Israel, I think it would be worthwhile just to take a minute, go back a little bit in history. For instance, between before the First World War, there were uh, no independent Arab countries. This area that is Israel today, and as a matter of fact, up to the Jordan, was considered uh, the southern part of Syria. When after the war, the uh, Great Britain got the uh, mandate over Palestine. Palestine was then between the entire area, between the Mediterranean and the Iraqi border. All of that was Palestine. There was one high commissioner and considered one, one country. The first partitioning of Palestine took place in 1922, when after the war, uh, Great Britain saw fit to parcel out this area of the Middle East and give part of it uh, to every one of the chefs who were helpful in the war. They had to do something also for Abdullah. So they partitioned Palestine, made the western part of, Pal of the Jordan River, Palestine. The eastern part was called Transjordan. The second time Palestine was partitioned was in 47, of course. Now, but until 22, all of that was one country, it was one Palestine. Of course, in, uh, in Transjordan, over this Jordan today, there are Bedouins, there are others, but you will not find one single country in this area, an Arab country, that hasn't various groups of Arab people. So to call to say that there is a Palestinian people as apart from those that are in Jordan, especially, is 
This is not true to, to fact, and not true to history. Now, between 48 and 67, after the War of Liberation, the Western Bank was later annexed by Abdullah, they were there. I, the, they were the majority in Jordan. If they wanted to set up uh, a state, or to call that state uh, Palestine, of course, they didn't have to ask our permission, and uh, we would have had nothing to do with it. Therefore, when they say the Palestinian people want the right to their land, what, what it really means is to drive the Jews out of this area and take over in addition to the about 19 or 20 independent Arab countries, all that have been created between the First and Second World War, create one more country instead of Israel. This is uh, really what it's meant. What, what, what then is the significance of the acts of terror that we see, the acts of pressure and propaganda of various kinds? Why then do these people behave as they do? They don't want us here. But uh, to my sorrow, it isn't only they that do not want us here. Who are they? They're the people who, because of the War of 48, fled this area into Jordan, into Syria, other places, and have never been resettled. That is, they were refugees. And uh, certainly, I admit, and one has to admit it, that as far as, as from the humanitarian point of view, there are groups of hundreds of thousands of people who have lived uh, in camps for uh, so many years under miserable conditions. Why haven't they been resettled? Jordan actually was not viable without these people. Jordan had a population of maybe about 300,000. Uh, why weren't they not resettled? Some of them were. But generally, why was there not a resettlement of refugees, of the Arab refugees? Because not only the refugees, but the Arab countries themselves felt that they should remain in their camps. They should not be resettled. It was one of the weapons against Israel. There were military uh, measures, there were uh, there's economic boycotts, and one of the methods was to keep the refugees in the camps, uh, feeding a hope that someday they'll march into the country and march us out. So um, they don't like us, they don't want us here. Our Arab neighbors to my sorrow, have not yet acquiesced to our existence, therefore wars. And uh, it's all one problem, really, that the Arabs in this area, the immediate area, are not prepared to live in peace with us. Mr. Nair, it appears from what you say that you accept that Palestinians, or whatever you want to call them, refugees, have been made victims one way or another that they have a legitimate grievance. Uh, what can be done to meet their grievance? Then? They have become victims through the fact that after the United Nations in 47 decided on the partitioning of Palestine, mind you, west of the Jordan River, into a Jewish state and an Arab state. We accepted. And uh, the Arab countries did not. And there was war. Can't imagine that there ever was a war without refugees. The difference is, in this case, that uh, the Arab people who fled the area that became Israel afterwards were actually among their own people. For instance, uh, we Jews are a classic nation of refugees. But uh, when we were refugees, we were uh, 
among strangers with the different people who have different religions, spoke a different language, a different culture, entirely different. These people are among their own people. It's the same language, the same religion, the same way of life. The fact that a line was uh, drawn didn't make them any different. And, uh, but that they suffered, I accept. The question is, was that necessary? Because during that period, during these years, Israel has absorbed from the Arab countries a much larger number of Jews than the number of Arabs that left this area. Uh, nobody speaks of uh, Iraqi Jewish refugees in, uh, in Israel or uh, Syrian Jewish refugees or Moroccan Jewish refugees. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, anybody that knows the situation will agree that uh, there was a greater clash between European Jews that came here or Israeli Jews who have been here for centuries, generations, and Jews that came from Yemen, or Jews that came from, uh, let's say, the Atlas Hills in Morocco. The only thing that really uh, made us one was religion. We we're Jews, we we're one of the same nation, but no common language and uh, sometimes uh, centuries apart in culture, and yet we absorbed them. And uh, we're one people. Is there anything, Mrs. Prime Minister, that Israel can do to remove this, this center of infection, really, a source of infection for the whole Middle East, these Arab refugees, these unsatisfied, unhappy people, unsettled, really? Because going around, as I've been doing the last few days, one still sees refugee camps that go back to 1948. Is there anything that Israel can do? We have said immediately after the war, after the War of Liberation in 48, 49, that uh, we are prepared to pay compensation for anything that these uh, people have left behind, whether it's uh, land, whether it's orange groves, whether it's houses, anything. We have uh, allowed tens of thousands of them to come back because the families were separated during the fighting. And if part of the families remain here, and if they uh, no problem of security, we allow them to come back. Now, the United Nations had a committee to investigate what these people left behind. And we cooperated with them. It comes up uh, large sums of money. Now, if there had been peace, this money, uh, the aid from international aid and from various governments, there's no doubt this thing would have been forgotten. And they would have been resettled in agriculture or in industry or in any other way. Instead, the United Nations, during these years, poured hundreds of millions of dollars into miserable camps. We found the camps now, for instance, in the Gaza Strip. It's, uh, it's unheard of that people should be kept in, uh, in conditions of that kind. But it was done with this idea, the worse the better. These people must be miserable. They must live in conditions of that kind. They must not resettle and have a home of their own or so on, uh, so that uh, they will be an instrument against Israel. What about the terrorism, Mrs. Mayer? Israel takes a very firm line against terrorists, against hijackers, uh, whereas other countries do not. What is the, uh, even when the lives of others are involved, you say, don't give in to hijackers? What is your reasoning there, since innocent lives are at stake? Innocent lives are always at stake. The question is, can 
innocent Israeli lives become a commodity that groups of men and women can just do with them whatever they like. Because uh, when they take a plane, for instance, let us take the, uh, the last uh, incident, the one of Lufthansa in, uh, in Germany. Uh, nobody would say that it's a simple matter. Of course not. But look what happens. These men demand the release from prison of men who participated in the killing of our people in the uh, Olympic uh, village. They say, and practice, but they say openly, we want them out. As soon as they land in Libya, they make a statement, now we'll start all over again. So of course lives are involved. But it means that uh, people are uh, set free when everybody knows that what they intend to do at the first opportunity, they will kill more Israelis. It's a difficult problem. I don't say it's easy. But uh, Israel cannot say, well, as long as it involves Israelis, uh, it's all right. Mr. Mayor, it is sometimes suggested that the terrorist organizations act out of a fear of a solution being arrived at between Israel and the Arab states. Is there a prospect of such a solution? A solution between us and the Arab states? Yes. I'm sure there is. The question is, when? Look, one must not, I think, look at the situation in the Middle East as though there are Arab countries that uh, involve themselves in war with Israel, but uh, it doesn't hurt them. It doesn't hurt their people. Their governments carry an immense uh, war budget, uh, but uh, their countries develop and they have uh, modern schooling and health services and so on. But for little Israel, it suffers. It's too bad about Israel. But it really doesn't matter. It doesn't affect so much the Arab countries. Of course, that's a distorted picture. Because as long as our Arab neighbors are at war with us, certainly they suffer at least as much as we do. As a matter of fact, we have managed with great difficulty to defend ourselves and at the same time uh, to, uh, to build a country which is more or less uh, decent, uh, more or less modern. It's not all that we wanted to happen or that could have happened if we didn't have to defend ourselves. But still, uh, we were 650,000 when the state was established. There are 800,000 children in school uh, today. And we have uh, compulsory free education from five and now from four to 15. There's not one single village in the country, no matter where it is, that is out of reach of a hospital or that there isn't a doctor in the area. And there's industry, there's modern agriculture, there is, uh, there is culture, there's music, there's theater. There's, I mean, I say it isn't all that we want. We could have done much more when in a country like this we have a community of close to 50,000 young men and young women in institutions of higher learning. All this was out uh, practically one single uh, month, I could say almost, without one single day of peace. Now, this isn't exactly what happened on the other side. So war in this area is something that is uh, hurtful to Israel and to the others. Peace, if it comes and when it comes, is uh, a very important uh, situation for Israel. We're not ashamed to say that we want peace, but also for the other countries. So anybody that is interested in this area must not fall into uh, a way of thinking, well, 
There ought to be peace because Israel needs peace. The entire area needs peace. And the tens of millions of people in our neighboring Arab uh, states, they are the main sufferers. Are you suggesting then that it is because they are suffering and it is because these countries are less well off than Israel is and the particulars you've cited that there is some hope of peace, that that will create the pressure for peace in Arab countries? Yes, I don't think that uh, our Arab neighbors will present us with uh, a present of peace. The real tragedy is that the leaders of these tens of millions of people in the various Arab countries do not realize how essential it is to their people. If they did, I think we would have had peace many years ago. Mrs. Mayor, can you offer any opinion, any theory about the intentions of King Hussein of Jordan at this point? Well, I think the uh, positive developments in uh, this area, as far as our neighbors are concerned, that King Hussein has come to the conclusion, evidently because he said so, that there must be a solution of peace between uh, Jordan and Israel, and I think he accepts that for all the uh, neighboring countries. And uh, he once said, I believe, that another war is another catastrophe, maybe a greater catastrophe for the Arab people. I don't think he has come to this conclusion uh, for Israel's sake, but he realizes what it, is, uh, what it has done to him and to his people, and knows what is happening in Arab countries better than I do. He knows that from, from his close contact with them. But that's a very positive development. The next thing that uh, King Hussein, I think, has to do is to realize that uh, since the war was brought on Israel by his participation, as well as Egypt and Syria and so on, he cannot expect and must not expect that everything goes back exactly where it was before he entered the war and attacked uh, Jerusalem again, as his grandfather did in 48, and attacked other parts of the country. When he comes to that conclusion, then we're really on the way to peace. How far, ca how, how close can he get to the situation as, as it existed before 1967? Well, that's... Uh, can only be done in negotiations. Uh, you know, it's a well-known fact that Israel has not drawn maps, and we don't play games with ourselves. It isn't that uh, we don't have ideas. We have them. But uh, the basic idea is, all other ideas are based on one idea that we want peace with our neighbors. And what we want to gain in peace is about territory is concerned, is not uh, territorial annexation. What we want is uh, change in territory to the extent that it is essential for us uh, to have borders that uh, promise uh, greater security than what we have before. Well, one gathers, Mrs. Prime Minister, that with Jordan it would not be a great problem but that you would, for example, insist on holding the Golan Heights taken from Syria, and that that might be a much more ticklish problem than the, uh, than the Jordan problem. I don't want to... Uh, Negotiate on a television program. No, no, I don't <laughs> want to say uh, to King Hussein that with Jordan there is no problem, because I don't think it, I, I would be uh, honest if I said so. There are problems. I have to see uh, his side of it, too. There is Jerusalem. Uh, not that uh, Jordan had any claim on Jerusalem. It was never decided that Jerusalem or part of it uh, should be Jordanian. And what happened in 48 was uh, by this uh, breaking of this terrible principle of the inadmissibility of conquest by force, we were weak in 48. Jordan was much stronger. The Arab Legion was a good army at that time, led by British, trained by British. 
and uh, they took part at Jerusalem. Uh, so I don't think he'll, he ought to get it back. I, I'm sure he won't, but he wants it back. So that, at any rate, from his point of view, it's a problem. Uh, then again, at the Western Bank, you can't expect us to restore the boundaries where they were before, so that we again have about uh, 12 miles between the sea and the former border. There are problems. There are not problems that cannot be solved. I think uh, all problems between us and our neighbors can be solved. Why should the Golan Heights be such a serious problem from Syria? Unless they, ex they again want to be in a position where they can shell our villages in the valley. If they had, they had no intention of that kind, and if they hadn't done what they did for so many years, there would have been no problem. Now they want us to come down again, come down from the hill to the valley so that they can put up their guns up above. That's, that's a problem. Mr. Mayer, one often hears that Arab leaders would find it very difficult to make peace with Israel if they could not themselves survive politically, maybe survive at all, if they did make peace. Uh, that thought to be particularly the case in Egypt, for example, and, uh, well, to name another one, Iraq. Could a man like President Sadat of Egypt survive if he made peace with Israel, do you think? Is that something you have to think about? Uh, I think we all have to think about it. The question is, is that our primary responsibility for Israel? What happens in these countries? <coughs> of course, one of the sources of the uh, tragedy is the regimes. They're not democratic regimes, they're dictatorships. Uh, each dictator, in order to keep himself above water, promises his people various things. One of the things that every dictator in this country promised, in this area, promised their people that Israel will be destroyed. Uh, one thing I think they can't be blamed for is that they didn't try. That they did and couldn't, did not succeed. <coughs> uh, maybe it's too much to expect from a dictator that he goes back to his people, has the courage to tell them, well, I've tried, you know I've tried, but he can't do it. And since you people are paying the price for it because of uh, illiteracy and because of poverty and because of uh, hunger and so on, we have to give it up. Live at peace with Israel and build ourselves. Now, uh, if you go on promising people that next month it's going to happen, I uh, objectively understand that it's difficult for him to do it. And maybe he's risking uh, his being in power, maybe even his life. But I'm sorry, I don't know how we can help him. Mr. Mayor, the Russians withdrew from Egypt at the demand of Egypt. And did, that, did that fact make a settlement or make the prospect of peace? Did it improve the prospect of peace in the Middle East? Very many people thought so. We hoped so. But actually, if you analyze the situation, we have never said that the Russians are driving Egypt to war against us. I think for two reasons, to be fair to the Russians. I don't think it's a major point in their policy to destroy Israel. What they wanted to do is to buy themselves, or to buy their entrance into the Middle East on the basis of feeding uh, Nasser or any other Arab leader what he wants most. And in 1955, they found that what Nasser wants most is not tractors, and not modern industrial plants and schools and so on. What he wants most is the tanks and planes in order to destroy Israel. But they were prepared to give it to them. 
to give it to him and kept on giving it to him all the time. Now, when they left, we thought, well, if Sadat became disappointed with the Russians, on what grounds? That Russia was not giving him enough material with which to destroy us. Maybe he'll make up his mind that, all right, he's lost this friend too. He doesn't believe the Americans will help him destroy Israel. Maybe then he should turn around and make peace with us. But that hasn't happened. You see, in all this, there's one more point that has to be taken into consideration. It's not only because we, we're, we're committed to democracy and can't envisage a different uh, regime. But look, whether it's Israel, whether it's the United States, any other democratic country, a government it takes a decision which it is convinced of is good for the people. It's not always popular. It goes to its parliament, presents it, uh, or whether the president says, it doesn't make any difference, but there's a body democratically elected that has to deal with it. But let us take our form of government, British form of government. Suppose the government decides something and uh, we go to to the parliament, what can happen? We lose the majority in parliament. So what? So there are new elections. When there are new elections, either we are re-elected or another party gets into government. The state remains. If we lose, we'll think uh, it's too bad. The others can't do as well as we do. The other party will think they'll do better. But nobody is killed. Uh, there is no uh, taking over by force. Nothing happens. Saddam, or Nasser before him, or Assad in, uh, in Syria, or the other one in Iraq, they're all, they always have to take into account that if they make a decision which is not popular, which is against the uh, education that they gave their people, He'll lose his post. He'll, he'll, he'll not be president again. How will he not be president? He will not be re-elected? A few generals or lieutenants may come in any moment and at the point of a gun send him out. Send him where? To prison or a better place. His personal life is in danger, his being president is in danger, that he must think of, and he doesn't. And this is the tragic part of this kind of regime of people. Dictators are supposed to be very uh, brave people. It isn't so. It isn't true. They're afraid. They don't trust anybody uh, around them, their dearest friends. Look what Stalin did to his people. Uh, look how Saddam started. The first thing is sending people to jail. And uh, I don't know, how does he take his decisions? Like, uh, like I do, we sat at cabinet meeting today from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, discussing things, different his opinion, we have to take votes. I don't know whether he has, uh, gets his ministers together and asks their advice. I don't know whether he doesn't get up one morning and says, well, now I'll do this, and does it. So this element, which is supposed to be a question of uh, philosophical uh, problem, what kind of regime of a social problem, really in a situation of this kind in the Middle East, it's a question of life and death to many, many people. Well, are the Russians coming back in now? Do you think Sadat has decided to have them back? Well, look what Sadat did, I imagine. When that bright morning he decided to tell the Russians, go home. I suppose what he thought was, now, the Americans don't like the Russians. So, if I send the Russians home, the Americans will applaud me. And then they'll come running and say, well, now, President Sadat, you're wonderful. Now you send the people we don't like away. Now just tell us what you want. You want us to squeeze Israel? Okay, that's just what we're going to try begin to do this afternoon. 
Uh, well, the Americans didn't do it. So he says, okay, as the Americans are now involved in uh, the political campaign, and the Jews are so influential, of course, without them there's no president elected in the United States, so never mind the, the president, and I'm going to go to Western Europe. Here is uh, the place where I can get things. And he sent his messengers to Western Europe. Nothing happened. And uh, the Americans don't help him. Western Europe doesn't help him. So now he's going to scare the Americans a little bit again. He's going back to the Russians. And he went back to the Russians. Here another phase of all this. Connected, of course, with everything that I said before. The lack of, call it courage, or whatever you wish to call it, of knowing that you're a sovereign state, a sovereign people, you have to carry the responsibility for your decisions and for your people. Don't expect somebody to do things for you. You've gone to war, you Egypt, not for that, so it was nice, it doesn't make any difference. Out of the blue in 67, you sent your army across the canal into the Sinai Desert, and uh, uh, Nasser said, this is the day, now we're going to do it. Fine, you tried. Couldn't succeed. Now, Israel immediately after the war says, okay, now let us sit down and negotiate a peace treaty. And the answer was no, no, no. The Americans will squeeze Israel. They remembered 56, 57, the Americans and the Russians will do it. And I'll sit back and threaten Israel. The Americans don't do it quick enough. I'll start a war of attrition. And if the Barlev line is not really destroyed, Never mind, I'll tell my people, as Nasser did tell his people, two-thirds of the Barlev line is destroyed. Not two-thirds, and nothing was destroyed. You see, the lack of courage to say to the people, first to tell them the truth, and then take responsibility. How do you Americans say, do it yourself? Don't expect, what is, what is the, uh, what is the dad been saying all the time? I'm not interested what Israel thinks. I'm not satisfied when President Nixon will tell me that he will influence Israel. Nixon must squeeze Israel. It doesn't enter his mind that Israel is not squeezable. This is my ear. Is it implicit in what you've been saying that the United States and the countries of Western Europe to whom Sadat appealed, applied, after the Russians left, is it implicit in what you've been saying, that they somehow missed the boat and that there was something they could have done? No. No, not at all. Uh, first place, uh, with all the uh, failures in international life and international relations and so on, there is a certain basis of uh, justice, of honesty, of decency. And when we say we're prepared to negotiate, and when we say we're even prepared to uh, carry on indirect negotiations, well, what, what else is expected of us? What should be expected of us? Certainly the United States has adopted an attitude that uh, we, we, can, we can't and should not be squeezed. The United States is prepared to help that the parties should negotiate. And I think European countries uh, did the same. And uh, now when Sadat went back to Russia, I'm not so sure whether he's so happy with what he's getting from his point of view. And uh, I don't know how things uh, will turn out, but first he sends them out and he goes back to them. And I don't say that, uh, this means that again, in the near future there will be 20,000 Russians in Egypt. But with the material that they sent, come what do you call them, advisors, instructors, with the part of purchasing. They're coming back in small numbers, I suppose. Mr. Mayor, there are two points I'd like to ask you about in connection with the territories Israel occupied after the Six-Day War. 
One has to do with the establishment of Jewish settlements, Israeli settlements in those areas. And uh, sometimes it is said that Israel is creating a fait accompli by settling in these areas, in some cases expelling Arab farmers to do so. In some cases, so it is said, um, driving people out of their houses to do so, destroying houses and the like. Maybe we just discuss first the question of settlement. What is it you are trying to do in the occupied territory? Exactly what we're doing. In parts of the occupied territory, uh, we're putting up settlements. That's true. We are not destroying Arab houses to put up settlements. We destroyed Arab houses in the miserable refugee camp in the Gaza Strip uh, to widen the road, right, also for security, because there were nests of uh, terrorists, but also for the welfare of the people, uh, covering up uh, the uh, sewage uh, open canals that were there, and setting up other houses for them, by the way putting in electricity and uh, water and so on. Now, I know that people say that because we're putting up settlements now, we're as though um, making it difficult uh, for Arab uh, neighbors to negotiate with us. But immediately after the war, we didn't have settlements. And we were prepared to negotiate peace immediately after the war. Now, we never denied that we will not go back to the 67 borders. And we said we want changes. And certainly these settlements uh, represent changes in the borders. But that doesn't mean that we're not prepared to sit down and negotiate. On the contrary, we want to negotiate. And uh, they're not, uh, they're, it isn't as though we come to a village, we drive the Arabs out, we destroy the houses and put a settlement to them. There's nothing farther from the truth than uh, this. It may be that sometimes uh, somebody has to be moved a little bit, not villages, not masses, sometimes an individual house, but then always with compensation and always with rebuilding the house. No, we're, we're not angels, but we're not that bad. Well, on that point, Mr. Mayor, I was reading that not merely that houses have been destroyed, which you deny or explain. I want to say this too. Yes. For instance, there have been houses destroyed in the Gaza Strip, or uh, very few also on the Western Bank, when these houses were nests of terrorists. That, that's true, but it had nothing to do with their settlement. Uh, there's been no confiscation of land to give to Israeli farmers, for example. That, that has been written. It's land that was state land, and if it belonged to individual people, uh, bought and paid for. And if they didn't uh, uh, want to accept the money now, at any rate, it's at their disposal, and we're prepared at any moment to negotiate. Some of the land, I gather, is crown land belonging to the king. That's right. Well, that's that's what we call state land, crown land. I, I have also read that there have been some deportations and that there have been, there have been some indefinite detention without trial in the occupied areas. Terrorists. A terrorist who some who have been caught in action have been put to trial, and others who belong to terrorist organizations and uh, helped and participated and so on, uh, are uh, in administrative um, arrest. Uh, that's true. Uh, less people do not know, I think maybe it's worthwhile knowing, that with all the terror that we had in the area, not one single, I can't say not one single death sentence there were one or two death sentences, but no execution of one single person. Nobody was put to death. Not one. You see, in our civil uh, laws, we did away with capital punishment. In our military uh, court, it is allowed for acts of war or treason or something like that. So that once or twice 
the military court decided a death sentence, and it was always changed to a life sentence. Because government decided in, uh, after 67 that uh, the uh, death sentence should not be required. But sometimes the judges themselves, the case is so serious that despite that, they themselves decide on death sentence, but then it is always turned into a life sentence. Mr. Mayor, I want to change the subject rather radically, I'm afraid. Uh, you were born in Kiev, you moved to Pinsk, you went to the United States in 1906 to Milwaukee. And you uh, have said, well, let's leave out Milwaukee for the moment, we'll get to that later. You're known as the mayor who made Milwaukee famous because I think you were born across from the What's Schlitz Pabst brewery. Beer? Was it was Pabst or Schlitz that made Schlitz, Milwaukee famous? But, <laughs> but I think for the, for the sake of safety, I'll say both Schlitz and Pabst. <laughs> the beer at any rate. <laughs> uh, but before we get to the Milwaukee part of it, you were born in Russia. You went to the United States in 1906, and you have said if there's any logical direction that your life has taken, desire and the determination to save Jewish children from experiences like those you knew in Tsarist Russia. How much of that lives in your memory? But the Jewish people has a very long memory, collectively. And masters of individual Jews have a similar memory, a similar memory. In the United States, if there is still people of my generation, I mean, immigrants at that time, this will be a repetitious story. It won't be Kiev, then it will be uh, Vilna, then it will be uh, Kovna, it will be Bialystok, uh, it will be uh, Moscow. It'll be, it doesn't ma a matter where it will be, but it's the same story, the same story. The first memory of many, many Jews, the first thing they remember, like I, is when my father and the upstairs neighbor were nailing up the doors because the rumors were that there's going to be another pogrom in Kiev. And this wasn't something that was so outlandish. There were pogroms, there were pogroms after. That, at that time, it did not happen. But the horror of uh, standing there and watching what our fathers were doing and knowing that it may happen, that lives in the, uh, in the hearts of many people. Some people, despite that, took a different uh, road. Uh, to me, this is something that, uh, as I said, was consciously or not unconsciously, has uh, decided my way in life. Do you find yourself having anything in common then with the Russian Jews who are now coming to Israel? Definitely, but with all Jews. Why not with Jews from the uh, Jewish children, for instance, who live in the ghetto in Syria today and uh, know what it means uh, to live in a ghetto and under terror because they're Jewish? Or uh, what happened during the Second World War uh, under Hitler? I mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's a question of... Uh, Sovereignty, I have two generations now of my own that were born here. Uh, this is one of the greatest, maybe the greatest thing in my person, the greatest thing in my personal life, certainly, that I have a son and a daughter and five grandchildren who, to whom what I tell them about my childhood is a story. They know that that's modern Jewish history and ancient Jewish history, but as far as their personal life is concerned, they knew no fear of that. There were wars, that's true. My granddaughter is through with the army service now. Uh, my children were in, in all the wars, but no fear of a pogrom, the no fear of having to hide away. About the Russian Jews who are coming here now, because that is a subject, obviously, that arouses enormous interest. Uh, do you find that the Russian government, the Soviet government, responds to pressure from the outside? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. 
This is the only thing that really can influence Russia. And look, with all that we have to say against Russia now, believe me, we have a lot to say against it, still we're getting some immigration, something we didn't have several years ago. Now, Stalin didn't, he couldn't have cared less what the world thought about him or about Russia. Khrushchev was different. These people certainly are different, and the situation in Russia is such. I must give credit to these people at least for one thing, even if it hurts me. They, they have a situation in, in, uh, among their people and their country. They are uh, desperately in need of help in the Western world. They have the courage to go to the Western world and ask for it and try to, to come to some arrangement where they can get it. There's no doubt, pressure from the West, from, from the world, that people should, uh, cannot be treated that way. People, that, what, after all, what do the Jews want in Russia? They want to go to Israel. They're not going out to attack Russia. They should be allowed to do it without misery, without being sent to prison, without being sent to insane asylums, without being sent to Siberia. Do you have any idea how many of them want to come out? Nobody has any idea. And if sometimes we hear from the Russians say very few Jews want to come out, all the more reason that they really believe that it's only very few Jews to let them go. And if it proves that there are many, let the many go. Every free country does that to its people. Because they could have had so much goodwill if they let the people go. And I hope they still will come to that conclusion. What is happening now, they are sending, allowing some people to go. Then they put ransom on people. Then some people they send to Siberia. And instead of gaining goodwill, they're destroying it. Mr. Mayor, there used to be a lot of talk, maybe it was a lot of guesswork, about the absorptive capacity of Israel. How many people you could actually have in this country support? How many people could actually support themselves? I should say. Is there a current figure that the Israeli government has in mind on that? You know that... <coughs> Between the day that the Great Britain got the mandate over Israel and the day of in, uh, and our independence, I think there were 20 odd royal commissions that came. Uh, so one royal commission once said, you can't, the, the country is so overcrowded that uh, you can't uh, uh, turn a uh, cat swing a cat. Who wanted to swing cats? We wanted to have people in the country. <laughs> then another royal commission said, not one more drop of water in this country. And of course, absorptive capacity, that was the problem. And uh, Dr. Weitzman once said, what is absorptive capacity? Every Jew that comes to then Palestine, in his suitcase, there's absorptive capacity for a few more Jews. And here we are. Now the population is uh, very, very close to three million. And now we know that so much of our country is still uncultivated and not settled. And things are developing instead of a track of a farm of so many acres, which were necessary for a family when we didn't have irrigation, there were no modern methods of agriculture. Now that same plot can support four families. And then industry and science and technology, there's no limit really, uh, no limit. We're not a people of 200 million. But uh, the numbers that we have, we can take. Was there ever a time, Mrs. Mayor, when you were in the United States, where you lived for quite a while, that you thought of staying there? That you thought you might be an American? Uh, before I came here? Yes. Well, suppose when I, I came there when I was eight, I became a Zionist, labor Zionist to be more correct, during the uh, First World War. I didn't be join the labor Zionist party until I decided that I would come to Palestine. Somehow I couldn't understand the idea that I'm for a Jewish state but I'll, I'll live in Milwaukee. So there weren't very many years. And uh, 
God knows it's not because the United States was not good to us, and <laughs> not because I didn't appreciate all that it had to generate. The difference between Zionism and the United States, but it's because of the Jewishness in me, and uh, because of this peculiar streak that if you believe something, you should uh, go and try to uh, accomplish it. So I, although I lived in the United States until I was uh, uh, 23, came here in 21. But uh, out of these years, quite a few number of years, I was involved in the uh, Zionist activity. Well, uh, we only have about two minutes left, Mrs. Mayor, and I, I do want to ask you a bit more about the past. You arrived in Tel Aviv in July 1921. Was it hot? <laughs> you became a teacher in a kibbutz, but you also, as I've read, picked almonds, you minded chickens, and you cared for children. You were married by that time, of course. And over the years, so I've read you have never been to a beauty parlor. You have a very limited wardrobe. You've had very little leisure. Do you regret any of it? Do you? First, first I must correct something which is more important than sure. anything else. I was not a teacher in a kibbutz. I took care of poultry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I baked bread <laughs> and washed clothes. Um, I'm a realist. And it may, I suppose, if I believe that if I go to a beauty parlor, I would really be beautiful, I suppose I would have done it. But I knew that that's, it won't help. This is it, I have to live with it. I certainly never regretted a thing in my life. Uh, I, I have more joy and satisfaction in my life than I will ever be able to tell of. When a person in his own life sees a revolution of this kind, uh, sees the Jewish people as a people of refugees, and a people that is either killed by some and pitied by the rest. A sovereign people, back in its own land, there are many problems and many troubles and so on, but still acting on its own, not pitied anymore at any rate. Uh, what else can a person want? Thank you very much, Mrs. Mayor. Thank you. Golda Mayer has been speaking freely. Edwin Newman, NBC News.